So today is our seventh workshop on documenting sources. We're going to talk all about what to cite, when to cite, and so forth. Oh, that's right. I forgot I have this. So just to recap then, like we usually do, previous workshops, uh, engineering communication, punctuation, sentence structure, paragraph development and revision, person and voice, conciseness and clarity, and the last one was on incorporating graphics. So today we're going to start with what information actually needs citing. We'll talk about just that general concept. How do you know if you need to cite something? Uh, we'll contrast paraphrases and direct quotations. How to paraphrase, how to quote directly, you know, when, when those two might be advantageous. Citing graphics, which is a separate sort of subgroup, and then I have some exercises for us to look at. And as always, if you have questions while we're going, please you know, feel free to ask. Uh, no need to wait till the end. So, starting off, what information needs citing? And I, the first thing I want to say before I get to the specifics is when we talk about what needs citing, there are some very basic rules and then many, 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 many exceptions. So a lot of it is a case-by-case -case situation where you have to look at a given scenario and decide, does this need citing, does this not need citing? It's not an easy yes or no answer a lot of times. With that in mind, we'll look at some of the basics. What do you need to cite? Any borrowed information, whether that's ideas, paraphrases, or summaries, because summaries are a kind of paraphrase, quotations, graphics, even structure and organization that can be specifically attributed to someone else. That's one area of information. And then another that's kind of a subgroup is direct quotations or paraphrases from a source. Now, the real key phrase here is, can be specifically attributed to someone else. Can you look at the ideas that are in question and say a specific person or a specific organization created those ideas? If you can answer that yes, probably it needs to be cited. If not, then probably it doesn't. All right, so that's, attribution is the, is the, 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 the technical word for it. But what we're really talking about is, do these ideas or does this information come from a particular person or a particular organization? And if the answer to that is yes, then probably we have to cite it. If not, then we, then we typically don't. All right, so here, the reason this is a subgroup is direct quotations or paraphrases from a source. This is about the ideas themselves in a lot of way. This is really just about the expression of it. So even if you had some information that by itself probably didn't need to be cited, but you borrowed a direct quotation about it, or even, even a very specific paraphrase about it, that would probably have to be cited. And the best example of that is a dictionary definition. If you look up a definition of a word in a dictionary, and you use that definition verbatim, that has to be cited. Not because the, the dictionary owns or even created the definition of table or coffee or technical communication or engineering or cookie or anything. It's that we're borrowing their expression of it, how they've talked about it. So that's a direct quotation. The idea itself, if you can come up with your own definition of cookie, engineering, technical communication, whatever it is, and it's accurate, that wouldn't have to be cited because definitions are sort of communally owned. It's almost like currency. You know, currency in a society has value because the community decided, the society decided, that the currency would have value. It doesn't, the paper itself has very little intrinsic value. It's what we've decided. And so definitions sort of operate in that same way. So if you can define it on your own and it's accurate, fine. If you're borrowing somebody else's expression of it, whether it's a dictionary, even a textbook, that would, that would have to be cited because you're borrowing their words to talk about this idea. So the flip side, what information does not need citing? Your own ideas and assertions, so things that you've created yourself, unless these ideas have been previously published. So that's the dividing line. And the other very big category is common knowledge, sometimes referred to as general knowledge information, that's not directly attributable to someone else. And we can break these down a little bit more. Now, the word published really should be in quotation marks because I, I'm encouraging you to define this term loosely. When we say, unless they've been previously published, it doesn't necessarily mean published in a journal. 
if it's been distributed somehow. In an academic setting, if you've written a paper for a class and submitted it for a grade, that hasn't been published in the most technical sense, but it has been officially submitted somewhere else. And that, the university actually says, in that case, you have to get permission, even though it's your own work, you have to get permission to use it again as the same document. Now, as professionals, we don't mind citing ourselves as, as authors. That's pretty neat, in fact, when you have a references section and your own name appears in it. So you want to think about this if you're using anything that's your own writing. Has it been previously published? Has it been previously distributed or submitted in some way? And in that case, you might, even just to play it safe, you might decide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, even though I wrote it, I'm going to go ahead and cite this just to make sure that I've covered my bases. Okay. Now, the other category, common knowledge information not directly attributable to someone else. What does that mean? Well, it means it cannot be assigned to a specific source, and that usually falls into the realm of historical facts. There are 24 hours in a day, for example. That is a fact that is mutually agreed upon by almost everybody. So if you were referring to the idea that there are 24 hours in a day, you would never have to cite that because probably somebody or a civilization at some point in the past came up with that notion, but it's accepted knowledge now. We don't really have to, have to think about it beyond that. Uh, any, any element of history, you know, the, the common example that gets used is Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865. Nobody referring to that fact would ever have to cite it as such because it's a historical fact. It happened. Now there are some historical facts that are shrouded in controversy sometimes, and there might be multiple versions, and so in that, in that case, if it's not a, a, a firm, concrete fact, then you might have to cite it. But generally speaking, historical facts do not have to be cited, and it doesn't even matter necessarily that you're unfamiliar with it. One of the examples I use with my students is a, a British sea battle called the War of Jenkins' Ear from 1741 which I learned about because I was an English major and you have to take history of England and you learn about you know, a lot of these historical facts. But that was a real battle in 1741. I don't even remember what it involved except a British sailor named Jenkins and something with his ear. I, I have no idea what it referred to. But very few people know about it because it's so obscure. But if you knew enough about that event and you were writing about it, you would probably never have to cite any of that because it's historical fact. So a lot of times what we end up citing is not so much because it needs citing, it's that we're not familiar with it. And the more we read, undergraduates are especially guilty of this, if you want to call it guilty, in that as they begin researching, they just cite everything, which is good, that's preferable to not citing and getting in trouble. But really what it is is they haven't read enough on the subject to know about it very much. So the other thing that falls under historical facts are a lot of technical or, or specialized ideas within your fields for example. So if I, if I asked you to write a page on you know, whatever your dissertation is on or whatever your major field of study is, there's an awful lot of knowledge that you would have that you wouldn't have to cite because you just, you've worked on it for years at this point and so you just know about it. But somebody else looking at that might say, well, you know, this isn't historical fact or it isn't common knowledge information. It's not common in that everybody knows about it, but it's common to the field of mechanical engineering, computational engineering computer science, whatever it might be. So again, this goes back to what I said at the very beginning. You have to take this situationally and look at individual pieces of information and say, okay, you know, does this need to be cited or does it not need to be cited? Okay, so let's pause for a minute then and talk about plagiarism. Kind of a negative subject, but we do need to make sure we understand it because anybody writing and presenting, communicating in general at a professional level needs to know what it is. Uh, it's, there are several varieties of it. Using someone else's work as your own, which is, is literally stealing the idea that somebody would take somebody else's paper, for example, in a class and turn it in with their name on it as their own. That's probably the most egregious or most extreme form of plagiarism. But a lot of plagiarism stems from inappropriate use of source material. Okay? Using source material too much within your work and not giving proper credit even not using very much of it and still not giving proper credit. All of that can be called plagiarism at some level, depending on how severe it is. So it all boils down to using other work and giving the impression that it's yours, even to the extent that you don't give enough proper credit to tell the author, or tell the audience rather, this doesn't belong to me, this came from one of my sources. 
As far as the penalties go, academic plagiarism can run the gamut from an F or a zero on the offending assignment, which is very light, that's a very light penalty, to an F in a course. Here at MSU, it's called an XF, and the X means an F earned uh, through academic misconduct, whether it's plagiarism or cheating or something like that. And here at MSU, this is typical, I'm on the committee for uh, the Honor Code Council, rather, so I'm one of the people that conducts hearings of students who've been accused of academic misconduct or violating the honor code in one way or another. And this is usually the, the bottom penalty that the, that the council will assign as an F in a course. Not on the assignment, but they, the, the, the student, if they've actually committed academic misconduct, and they will fail the class. And that's usually much, much more severe for graduate students than it is for undergraduates, because graduate students are sort of held to a higher standard, and they're working with research, intellectual property, copyright issues, that kind of thing. The X can be removed uh, to, to get the, the academic misconduct or honor code violation removed off of it, but the F grade always stays. And then beyond that, suspension or expulsion from the university, and even up to, to loss of degrees, actually being stripped of degrees, which I, I've read many case studies of where that's actually happened. Not necessarily here at MSU, but it can. If you're not familiar with the honor code, I've provided the URL. It's actually at the bottom of the second page of our handout. I've got a few links and the resources there for you. And the honor code kind of spells all of that out and talks about MSU's policy about academic misconduct, which you should be familiar with if you're not already. So as bad as academic penalties go, workplace penalties to me are actually even worse because it gets to monetary issues. If, if you run into problems with plagiarism on the job, you can lose job rank or be demoted. You can actually lose the job and be terminated. Again, you can lose degrees, and you, know, you face the threat of legal action, because in the workplace, we really start to get into issues of intellectual property and copyright infringement, which companies take very seriously. It, it's, a, it's a place where they can lose money. I read a case study a few years ago about a, a faculty member, it's a university in the Northeast, United States, I don't remember exactly what college it was, but he had stolen one of his colleagues' uh, journal articles and published it as his own and hadn't changed any of the data or anything but went in and changed some of the details to make it look different, but it wasn't different enough and he got caught. It was a long, drawn-out process, but at the time the article was published, the one who had, who had done the plagiarizing got fired he had been stripped of his PhD and his master's degree because after that happened, his home institution went back and looked at his dissertation and found that it had been, I think, 80% plagiarized or something like that. And then they found the same thing with his master's degree. So he, he got fired and lost you know, two of his major degrees and was probably going to have a very hard time working again. And that was an extreme case, obviously. That was somebody who really, to be generous about it, was not thinking clearly. They actually took somebody else's writing and tried to pass it off as their own. But the point is it's taken very, very seriously here and elsewhere. And so you want to be sure that you're doing it right. Now, this is a lot of text for this slide, but it's an important quote. It's an email I got from a student several years ago about a research paper that their team was doing in my class. And it really did a good job of capturing what the issue is when we're dealing with, with sources and references. So the person said, I'm editing my group's paper right now, and I have a few citing concerns. No one in the group is a Chernobyl expert. Their topic was the Chernobyl uh, nuclear meltdown in, in, the, in uh, the former Soviet Union in the 1980s. No one in the group is a Chernobyl expert, so obviously all our information came from one source or another. That said, our abstract is citationless. Abstract didn't have any citations. The information in it isn't too terribly specific, but it's not exactly common knowledge either. We wrote the abstract just off memory of what we learned from all the things we read. It just looks strange to me that the paper has nearly one-third of a page of information without any citation. And as a teacher, I like this for two reasons. Number one, they were being conscientious. They were actually worried about, are we using sources appropriately? How does it look to the reader that, you know, maybe we're not citing enough? That sort of thing. The other reason I liked it is that, it, again, it's such a good expression of what this issue is. And I think before I responded, I literally cut and pasted the email and put it in a Word document because I knew I was going to use it like this because it's a good way to approach the subject. The key phrase in all of that is, we wrote the abstract just off memory of what we learned from all the things we read. This is called knowledge acquisition. That's how we learn things. 
you know, whatever we're experts in, we weren't born that way. We learned about this stuff over time. So it all came from somewhere else, but the fact that it came from somewhere else does not by itself mean that it has to be cited. It depends on what kind of information it is. So we come back to some of these principles. If the details are accurate and cannot be logically attributed to somebody else, then it is correct not to cite them. A lot of the, the details about Chernobyl and that nuclear meltdown are historical facts. They happened, they were recorded by multiple news agencies and international agencies regarding uh, nuclear power. So we know without controversy what happened. And if you know enough about that and have read widely enough, then that counts as historical fact and you don't have to cite it. If the details were created by someone else, then you should cite them. One helpful way to think about this is, is this. The length of a paragraph or passage has no direct relation to the inclusion of citations. You could write pages upon pages upon pages and not cite anything, and that's not a bad thing. It just depends on what you're talking about and how much you know about it. Okay? Again, it's conscientious to think about it that way, but that by itself uh, doesn't mean anything. And so the premise from that is don't confuse unfamiliar information with information that needs to be cited. Just because you're not familiar with it, that alone doesn't mean that it has to be cited. You have to look at it for the kind of information that it is. So a helpful way of, of visualizing this is through triangulation of general knowledge. And triangulation works here the same way that it does with statistical data, where instead of taking a fairly small set of data and forming conclusions on that, you get a larger area and, and try to get more of a sense of, of what it says. And so that's what happens here. If you're talking about a topic that, you, that's, that counts as historical fact, but you happen not to be familiar with it. Just say Chernobyl. Say you're going to do research on Chernobyl and, and you begin and you think, wow, I don't really know a whole lot about this. The tendency might be to cite a lot of that, but what you would really want to do is one, read about your topic in at least three different locations and probably more than three as you're doing research, but the idea here is to read about it in more than three different locations and what that means is when you get to two and write your own version from memory, Instead of writing your own version of the Chernobyl events based on one, if, if it's one source that you've read and you write your own version, what's going to happen? It's going to really pull from that one version. But if you've read about it in multiple places, those three sources will kind of get jumbled up in your head and what you write then is your own version of historical events. And then three, you go back and confirm that with sources because you don't want to assume that you got everything correct. You want to go back and look at it and say, okay, that I, you know, dates, for example. Some people are not very good with dates, so you want to go back and make sure you get the dates correct. And that's one way that you can, and what it is, it, it, it does a couple of things. It mimics human knowledge acquisition. It's how we acquire knowledge. We read and we, you know, uh, encounter it by different media or from uh, the influence of our peers or family members or whatever, and that's how we acquire that information. But it's also the research process. This is just how we do research. We, I mean, you know, anything that you guys work on, you're reading who knows how many journal articles about specific studies and, and you know, st uh, statistical data sets and things like that. And so that's, that's how you acquire that knowledge and you begin to know more about it in that fashion. So it's, that is a, is a fairly clinical way of doing something that we all kind of do anyway when we begin to learn about this information. So you do all this, and what happens if you're not sure? Well, that's pretty simple. One, ask for advice from somebody who should know. So if your major professor is available, then that's somebody who ought to be able to answer the question for you or at least give you some guidance. Those of us in our program, this is one of the things that we can sort of claim expertise on, or, or we've studied it enough that we can give you uh, some fairly insightful judgment about it, or somebody else who may uh, you know, be able to give you some tips on that. If you can't get a firm answer, then just go ahead and cite the information anyway. Because citing something when it doesn't need to be cited may be incorrect, but it's not an infraction. It's not plagiarism. It's the opposite of plagiarism, in fact. It's much better to do that than say, well, I'm not sure whether I need to cite this or not, so I guess I won't do it. That's, that's a very risky move because, and a lot of times, there, there are published historians, for example, in the last 10 years, uh, who got in a good bit of trouble and got a lot of bad press because they had hundreds of pages of books that they'd published that were plagiarized and the story was they had editorial assistants who didn't do what they were supposed to do and so they wound up going through, they copied information from elsewhere and they were going to paraphrase it and, and put it in some form in the book and it ended up just getting cut and pasted into the book 
and they kind of got in trouble. So sometimes that can happen um, innocently almost that we don't really know about it. But that's why we have to be very careful. And if we absolutely just can't get a firm answer, go ahead and cite it. Go ahead and cite it anyway. Any questions to this point before we move into paraphrases and quotations? Yes. Well, probably, for most people, if they're writing it from memory, it won't match another source exactly. Sometimes people think it will because it sounds familiar, but if you look at it, it's not. Because what we're talking about is really an exact match or whole sentences being an exact match. Somebody who has photographic memory, if you've ever heard of that, they literally remember things in, in an incredible level of detail. That might be an issue, but typically it's not. If it were to be a problem, what you'd want to do is go in and modify it somewhat. It's possible you could decide to quote that, too. One of the problems with quoting, and we won't really get into this today because uh, we don't have time, but one of the problems with, with quoting or excess quoting is that it gives the reader the impression that you're just using what other people said. Even if you're doing it appropriately, it gives this sense that you don't really know your subject well enough. Now, it may be that Newton's third law is not the most important idea in what you're writing, and so if you quoted that, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But if I have a student, for example, who writes on the modified Proctor test in civil engineering, and if they start the paper saying, the modified Proctor test is open quotes, and then they quote this definition from somewhere, that's a terrible idea because what it tells me is they don't know enough about the modified Proctor test to define it on their own, and they ought to be able to do that. They ought to know enough about that test that they could describe it for me and define it for me as they want to. So what you would want to do is take your version and match it with some example of Newton's third law or, or some write-up of Newton's third law and see how close it is. If it's not very close, I wouldn't worry about it because that's assumed to be general knowledge. It's, even though we know Newton derived it or first described it, we don't always have to cite Newton for that. It's just like if, if something happens with gravity, we don't, you know, we knock something over and it falls on the floor, we don't have to cite Newton right there because, oh, it's gravity, Newton, that's Newton's baby. No, he, he discovered it, described it first, but it's a natural law. And then if it turns out that your write-up is similar to the one you're talking about, then I would go in and change it up. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about right now is how to do that. Yeah. That's a good question. Probably, well, first of all, you should always cite whatever you used yourself. Right. So if you haven't read the document on which the textbook is based, you wouldn't want to cite that document because then you're citing it without seeing it yourself. So you don't really know what it said. You haven't seen it. So you would want to go with the textbook. What you would probably want to do is briefly describe what you just described to me, that the idea comes from the textbook but it's, it doesn't originate with the textbook. It actually comes from somewhere else. And so you want to make mention of that. That's, that's how I would handle that. And, but, and that would depend on how well known the, the, you know, the, the 100 plus year old theory is and so forth. It might be that just citing the textbook is fine. Again, that's, that's kind of a trade-off that you have to decide about. If you have time to reword it yourself, because it can take a while to do that, if you can reword it yourself, that would be better than simply quoting it. But if it turns out that it's worded in such a way that you really can't say it, and a, a lot of times people will say that, well, there's only so many ways you can say X. That's usually not true. There are usually quite a few ways you can say it. It's whether somebody wants to do it. But occasionally you'll arrive at something the way it's written is about as simple as it gets. And in that case, you probably would just want to quote it.
because then to reword it is going to take so much time that it's probably not worth doing. But that also depends on how much else you've quoted in your document. If you've already quoted quite a few things, you might not want to quote something else. Then you might want to, that might have to be a paraphrase, so you might have to do it that way. So you have to keep an eye on how much you've done that already. So it doesn't look like you're just quoting and quoting and quoting over and over. All right, so let's start with paraphrases. A paraphrase is a borrowed excerpt from a source that does three things. One, it significantly alters or modifies the original passage's wording and sentence structure. It retains the passage's meaning, and it provides a citation but not quotation marks. So when you're paraphrasing, paraphrasing an idea that's attributable to somebody else, it has to look and sound different than the original to some degree, but it still has to have the same meaning, and you still have to cite it. And that's important for a lot of writers who are unfamiliar with this because there's a sense for some people that a paraphrase just means you take an original passage and you change a word or two, and then you just do whatever you want to with it. And that's absolutely untrue. It has to be changed significantly, or if you're going to retain it as is, uh, then you quote it. So let's look at an example. <coughs> Here's the original passage. To create functional and marketable embedded automotive applications with GUIs that use dashboard displays, developers must be able to successfully address all those problems. The unacceptable paraphrase, and I'm reading this out loud because it's helpful to hear what it sounds like, Unacceptable paraphrase, to create functional and marketable embedded automotive applications with graphical user interfaces that use dashboard displays, developers must be able to address problems associated with the size and performance of the interface. So as I explained down here, this is an unacceptable paraphrase because it's too similar. In fact, it's almost identical to the original. They've spelled out GUIs as graphical user interfaces, and instead of just saying all those problems, they've said problems associated with the size and performance of the interface, which are fairly helpful changes, but it, it follows the exact same structure, and so many of the words are identical that it's just not an acceptable paraphrase, and it hasn't been cited. So it's really like a quotation that hasn't been quoted and has not been cited. That's a very bad thing. You don't want to do that. This is an actual student passage from years ago that I used in this way, um, and, and they unfortunately got in some trouble for doing this. So one version of an acceptable paraphrase of this, and it's not the only right answer, but it's one way you could do it. According to author, and I didn't keep track of who the author was, but you would put that person's name there, engineers must solve a host of technical and commercial problems in order to create successful embedded automotive applications that use GUIs and dashboard displays. And I have a citation. And one important thing to note is when you change up the wording to make an acceptable paraphrase, you don't have to change essential terms. Embedded automotive applications is absolutely critical to what this is saying. There's no reason to change that because that's, it's everything else that you want to make sure you don't follow the structure and that you find a different way of saying some of this. GUIs, you couldn't do it without that. You couldn't do it without dashboard displays. Most of the rest of this wording, though, has been altered, though, at that point. All right. So one important question to ask, too, is if we weren't going to, you know, if we, had, if we were going to quote this directly, Obviously, we'd have to cite it. But if we're paraphrasing it, are these ideas that would need citing anyway? So I'm asking you that. Reading this passage here, are these ideas that are attributable to somebody else that would have to be cited, or do they count as fact? But the rest of them. Well, I'm going to disagree with you. <laughs> I'm going to say that this one does. And I, I'll, I'll admit, I could be swayed the other way. I don't think it's a hard, you say absolutely yes, absolutely no. My sense is that, and it has something to do with the idea of saying developers must be able to successfully address all these problems. That sounds more like opinion than fact to me. Now, it may be very sensible opinion. It may be 
just you look at that and you say that just makes all the sense in the world. But me personally, I have a hard time looking at that and saying that's an absolute fact, no problem at all. I would say that probably needs to be cited instead. But again, I don't. It's not a yes or no question. I think I could be swayed another way about that. But if we were on the fence about it, my advice would definitely be to go ahead and cite it because we're not. I don't think we can be sure. I don't think we can be absolutely sure. One thing that would help too. And, we, and I'll get to you in just one second. One thing that would help, too, we're taking this as an excerpt. It's one sentence out of a long article. If we read the whole rest of the article, we might have a much better sense of whether this was a fact or whether it was an opinion. So we, admittedly, we're just looking at this one passage. If we read the whole thing, we might have a very different idea. Yes? No, this is the original passage. So if you were going to, if you were going to quote this statement, obviously you would cite it. But if you read this and you wanted to express this idea and you thought, well, I don't, I don't want to quote it and I don't think the idea necessarily needs to be cited, so I'll kind of rephrase it in my own terms and not have to cite it, the idea being it's just general knowledge or it's common knowledge or it's a fact. And what I'm saying is that I, th I think it's a little bit closer to opinion and I would be worried about not citing that because it seems like maybe you could say this is somebody's idea instead of this is just the way it is, even if it's logical. All right, here's another one, original passage. One way in which microturbines are distinguished from larger metro turbines is that microturbines use a single shaft to drive the compressor, turbine, and generator. And this is the paraphrase. One way in which microturbines are different from larger metro turbines is microturbines use one shaft to drive the compressor, turbine, and generator. Is this an acceptable paraphrase? No, clearly not, right? It's just like the other one. It's almost identical. It's very, in fact, I think, right, distinguished and different. They said one instead of single. So they, they made some changes, but it's, it's very much the same as the other one. So no, that would not be an acceptable paraphrase for the same reason the other ones are. Too many words are the same. The structure is nearly identical. There's no citation, none of that. Okay? So we want to apply the same type fix here. Here's one example of an acceptable paraphrase. And what, what I actually wrote the acceptable paraphrase, so what I did is just reverse it, where this one starts with, uh, it mentions micro turbines first. I kind of turned it around and started with metro turbines. While metro turbines have multiple shafts, micro turbines have only one shaft that drives the compressor, turbine, and generator, and then I cited it. And again, the essential terms those are essential to what we're trying to say as is shaft. No reason, no reason to change those. Now, I asked the same question about this one. If we encountered this passage and decided we didn't want to quote it directly, and so we had to decide whether we could paraphrase it on our own, would we want to cite it? Does it need to be cited? And another way of asking that is, is this more like fact or is it more like opinion? Does it need to be cited? Yeah, this one is definitely more like fact because we're essentially defining these two types of turbines. That, and that's not, as far as I'm aware, and I'm certainly no expert in this field, but as far as I'm aware, that's not a matter of opinion. That's just defining what these things are. So this you could probably get away without citing if you weren't borrowing their exact wording like this. So if you came up with your own, uh, your own way of saying it, then you probably wouldn't have to worry about it. Now, a direct quotation is a passage that appears in your document exactly as it appears in the source. It must be enclosed in quotation marks, and it must have a citation. Okay. Now, the, one of the big issues with quotations is they cannot stand alone. They can't be their own sentences. And that's what uh, English teachers like, like, like us call a dumped quote. And the problem with it, quite honestly, is this period. So you have this lead-in statement. So if you wrote this, these are your words. Cheney suggests that laboratories should attempt to foster global teamwork, period. Then, open quote, and we have the quotation that's a sentence all by itself. Okay, that's incorrect. It has to be attached in some way to your own, to your own words. And there's a couple of ways that we can do that, and they're very simple. One, and this is for a complete sentence quotation, is a lead-in phrase and a colon. So we literally have the exact same passage here with a colon instead of a period. And that shows that they're connected. This leads into this, and this is no longer its own sentence all by itself. That's fine. Everything else is the same. 
The other way, we have a shorter lead-in, and when it's shorter, we would just put a comma instead of a colon. Cheney states, and that could be any verb that fits. Cheney argues, Cheney claims, et cetera, et cetera, and then we have the rest of the quotation, and that's correct to do it that way. Now, that's for complete sentence quotations. When you're using just pieces of it, you literally can just splice them into your own sentence. So in this one, this quote from this person named Cheney is just sprinkled throughout your own sentence. Cheney suggests that laboratories should, open quote, create their own online database of commonly prototyped enzymes, end quote, and that the benefits of such a system for, and then we open the quote again, other perhaps less affluent facilities would be unprecedented. We still cite it, and that citation counts for both of those. So we don't have to provide the citation twice because they're close to one another and it's the same source. Okay? Now, the one thing you have to be careful with here is that you don't change the meaning, and that's people taking pieces of a quotation out of context. Uh, sometimes they change the meaning. So as long as you're doing that, then you're fine. And the only reason why you would do one or the other is really a stylistic choice. If you decided you wanted to write it this way instead of using Cheney's entire sentence, there's no real reason for one, doing one or the other. It comes down to a matter of style and, and how you want your sentence to look. So those are the two big rules to remember, uh, to remember about that. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going over a lot of other information about quotations because there are many, 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 many other exceptions and rules and so forth. So what I'll do is instead just direct you to our handout. It's called Documenting Sources, and I've included this URL on the handout for you. Pages two through four of that handout specifically deal with quotations and some special circumstances for quoted material. So if you're quoting uh, information in your own writing, I would use that handout, and that'll cover most of the scenarios that you'll see. Now, as far as one versus the other, there's really no firm rule to say you should paraphrase here and you should quote here. One general idea to keep in mind, though, is you should quote when the author's exact words are important. That's, that's really one of the reasons. If, if you look at the wording and say it's important to, in, to include the words exactly like this. Like if you think of the slide I showed from a student a minute ago about Chernobyl, instead of just using a vague example of that, I wanted every one of, all those words were important because of the way they said it. So that's why I quoted it that way. And that's one of the reasons you would do it. Or a passage that contains many technical terms that you have no easy alternatives for then maybe you should quote that because it's going to be a lot of work. Paraphrasing can be a lot of work because you take a sentence or two and then have to say it, you know, 20 words and say it in 20 other words, but the meaning has to stay the same. That's not an easy thing to do necessarily. So you want to be cognizant of that and, and make sure that you're using your time wisely, and sometimes quoting might be the best way to do that. Sometimes you may have a, a reader or a professor who doesn't want you to quote so much because they think it looks like you're borrowing too much information. And so in that case, you may have to do the paraphrasing instead. A couple of things to keep in mind about it, though. As I just said, paraphrasing is more work than quoting, so you want to keep that in mind. I got ahead of myself a little bit. The other one is to remember that even with a research document, it still needs to be your own work. Okay? Research exists to support your ideas. You're not Except in, in a few different cases, a literature review, for example, the purpose of a literature review is to see what other people have said. So it's less your own work than it is a way that you look at what other people have said, but it's usually a part of your own work, where as, as you're describing your own theories or your own work, you're saying, here's what already exists about this topic, and then you build on that. Outside of that, it should just be your own work. You don't want it to be a string of paraphrases or just quotations. So you want to use it appropriately. You also want to use it sparingly. Make sure that you're not overdoing it too much. That's more of an issue for undergraduate students, frankly, than it is for graduate students. Now, real quickly before we move into some exercises, citing graphics uh, is very simple. You do it at the caption that, that's attached to the graphic. So for a figure, it's always below you always have, for in, in this case, figure one, the Sutton Who burial site. This is an archaeological dig in England from many years ago. The citation for that would just go right there. <coughs> Excuse me, right at the end. For a table, it's the same thing, but that usually is on the top. So when you have a table, that caption goes on top of the table, and then that citation goes right there, and it's that simple. And I'm using a numeric system here in brackets, but any kind of citation would, would, would work that way. So that's how you do that. And what I haven't said here, but I'm implying it, 
graphics operate the same as words. If the graphic didn't, doesn't belong to you, then it probably has to be cited, unless it's free of copyright somehow. If you created the table, if you took the picture, if you created the chart, different story, but if you borrowed it from somewhere, then that would have to be cited. A few additional issues. Any source that you list in your references section has to be cited somewhere in your paper. And this is sometimes confusing to people because of the differences between a reference section and a bibliography. Now sometimes, for our purposes, references, that means the sources that you've used in your paper. That means they're cited somewhere in your writing. Sometimes a bibliography is used to mean that exact same thing. A bibliography means a references section. In many cases, though, a bibliography means sources related to your topic. So it's, it's reading articles, books, whatever, about the topic you're writing about, but you haven't necessarily used them as sources in your own paper. When you have a references section, though, that's all this is. Anything that's listed in your references section should be cited somewhere in your paper. If it's a bibliography, it might be a little bit different. And that may vary some with your audience or situation, but, but usually not. That's usually how it's done. Presentations we're not getting into today, but they're cited essentially just like papers are. If you borrow text in your presentation, it should be quoted, paraphrased, cited, just like we we're talking about here with, with papers. <clears throat> and that's actually going to be covered next week, but I wanted to mention that here since we are talking about citing. Uh, I'm not going over specific citation styles because there are so many and because you may have to follow different ones. There's not one that everybody uses. Two of the most common are IEEE's uh, sources, and I've also put this on your handout for you to look at. They have a PDF that covers all of their uh, citation styles. We have our own system in our program that's based very much on the IEEE system. It's a little different than that, but it uses numbers and square brackets. And then the other one is the APA system, the American, even though it's in the social sciences, psychological association, it's very widely used in engineering as well. And so that website has everything you would want to know about that. So if, if you have to cite sources, but your reader, your professor, whoever it is, hasn't told you one to pick, these are two good ones that you might use. If it is these, then these are good, these are good references for you, to, for you to look at and find uh, what you need to know about that. And one thing, too, citing sources, obviously, as opposed to, to memorizing, you know, what you're supposed to do with a particular type, you know, a book, how that's supposed to be formatted and so forth, obviously, when you go through and do your references section, you want to have these right next to you or looking at them so that you can make sure you follow the rules exactly. Uh, people who, who expect you to follow these really do expect you to follow them very, very closely. Theses and dissertations, for example, are supposed to be done a very specific way in the library, for example, will really look at those and make sure that you've done them correctly. So when you get to that point, you want to make sure that you're looking at a style guide, whether it's these two or there are many, many, many more besides these two. Uh, but whatever you're using, you want to make sure you're looking at the directions and following them closely. All right, so let's look at a couple of exercises, and we'll start this way with a, with a multiple choice. Which of the following statements need to be cited? A, an experienced senior computer engineer makes around $64,500 to $96,700. B, as of 2002, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics counts 675,000 computer software engineers holding jobs in the U.S. C, in a previous paper, we discussed the results of a noise control study using armored Humvees. D, all of the above. E, none of the above. You say all of the above? Well, it, I mean, it could count as history in that sense, but the answer is that they're all, they all have to be cited. And the reason is, kind of going one by one, A, why does that one have to be cited? Exactly, yeah. These kinds of things come from surveys, and it's not, it's a funny area, because if you have a lot of confidence that these numbers are right, you might consider it historical fact, but if you do that study 10 years later, what's going to happen? It's not going to be the same. So you can't really call it, it's, it's a fact, but it's, 
It's only a fact for so long because it's something that changes over time. The more important point is what you said. It comes, you, you can attribute it specifically to probably somebody like the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics or uh, IEEE or the Association for Computing Manufacturing, uh, some type of professional society that would do that sort of work. So you can attribute that specifically to somebody. Why, was, why would B have to be cited? Yeah, we actually say who it's from here. It's the same reason we do it here. It's just here we've actually said it. And that throws people sometimes because they think, well, you said it here so you don't have to cite it. No, you still have to cite it even if you, even if you say this is where it comes from because we know that information came from one particular place. And the same thing applies here. This is 2002. I probably should update this. I'm sure they've done it since then. In 2012, it's, it's probably a little bit more than that, if not maybe, maybe a lot more than that. I guess it could be less as well. What about C? It's a giveaway. That's, this is the one that undergraduates, I use these same examples, and undergraduates won't get that one. They'll think, well, that's, you wrote it. That's yours. You don't have to worry about it. No, no, no. That's, we don't have any specifics, but suppose that's been published you know, in a, you know, the Journal of Applied Plastics Technology or something. Yeah, that's actually been published. The other thing we don't get into is when you get published in a peer-reviewed journal like that, very often you sign away the copyright to them. So in a le you don't own it legally at that point anymore. And, and so to say it's yours, well, I wrote it. You did, but <laughs> they have some control of the copyright now, so it's actually not totally yours anymore. So yeah, all of those would have to be cited for those, for those reasons. Very probably, it will it will see it. Yeah. Well, that dissertations are a tough call a lot of times because, and I know this. My wife is as a PhD, and she did her dissertation. A lot of times, when people do dissertations, their dissertation becomes sometimes multiple journal articles. They take it and turn it into an, and so there's a little different set of rules for how that works. In your case, it's the other way around. And I, again, because it's a dissertation, it's a little bit different. I would be wary of, because it's been published in a journal, of using it without citing it, though, in some way. And I don't, now that, well, all that really means is I would want to find out from somebody else. Like, I would ask your professor, you know, what do I, does this need to be cited? Maybe the library, if they're over the dissertation, because they have an office there that does that, you know, they'll be able to tell you one way or another. I, I wouldn't just use it without asking, though. I think that probably needs to be cleared up to make sure. Because, like you say, it's the opposite. Usually, it's the dissertation, and that becomes an article. And a lot of times, I've seen in articles where it said this began as a PhD dissertation. So you'll have that note in the article. The other way around, though, I, I don't know. And it may be that that's fairly common. I'm really not sure. You would just need to find out from them. If you can't get a firm answer, I would figure out a way to cite it, though. That would be the safest thing to do, because then you show, you're showing that it's already been published somewhere else, so that you're making it known from your end, this has been published here, and it's also a part of my dissertation. But there's probably somebody who will be able to answer that uh, more thoroughly than I am, because I don't work with dissertations on a daily basis. Okay, so this refers to the handout that I gave you. Uh, and what I've asked you to do is to look at this original passage. Uh, the top one is the original passage, and the bottom one is a student passage that uses the original. So read through both and then answer the question, has the student appropriately paraphrased the source passage? Why or why not? And if it's not, then revise the portions that are not paraphrased correctly to make them appropriate. Yes, would you take her one as well back there? about to walk it back there to you guys. There you go. <clears throat> so we don't have to work on these alone necessarily, but read through them and then we'll kind of talk about it and see, you know, what, if any of them need to be fixed, what parts need to be fixed. And then we've got a couple of short ones on the back as well. So let's start with that. Just read through these and uh, we'll see what they tell us. 
Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about this. So, first question was, the student passage, have they paraphrased the source passage appropriately? No, not at all, right? <laughs> uh, it's hidden a little bit. Uh, so we have... I believe it starts right here in their borrowed version. That's the first part. All of that is, if not identical, it's very close to identical from the original. Now, one, one thing to, to point out here is lists like this you can often get away with that if that's the right way to say it because there's not many, especially if the order is intact, like it has to be you know, item one through item four, many times you can get away with that because it's not, there's not a more reasonable way to say it. Uh, but it's after that where we, where we really get into some issues, especially this phrase right here, is sandwiched, is not a not a common way to say that probably in this field. And so if, they, if you were a teacher looking for plagiarism, for example, not to, not to make it too negative, but that would really catch your eye. You would think, wow, that's, that's, there's no way that's an accident. You know? and, and especially with students, one of the things they love to say is, well, there's only, you know, there's only so many ways you can say it. Well, you, you, you just can't even make that argument about that. It's just way too close to the original. But I think it's that whole sentence also. The specimen is sandwiched between transmission and incident bar. And then, an, it should be. That, that's the other thing that's sort of interesting about this. This original passage is really not very well written. There's a lot of mistakes and so forth in it. I, I went and followed, this is from a few years ago, and I went and followed this link, but it doesn't exist anymore, so I, I couldn't find anything more about it. But it's not a very good, and it, it, what's interesting is that they, they actually cleaned up some of it here in the student passage, which I guess you want to give them points for, you know, trying, but uh, it's still not correct. But yes, it absolutely should be bars right there. And, for example, these commas, we wouldn't want those at all. They're very awkward, and they left them out, which is good, but they still barred that entire sentence without, you know, without changing, without changing any of it. And I think it stops about here. And then they don't really use the rest of that. They kind of get into their own material or what appears to be their own material after that. But so you've got from here down to here that's more or less borrowed verbatim. And that's clearly not appropriate. So how difficult would it be to reword some of this, do you think? Yeah, I, I, just looking at it, I didn't write anything down, but looking at it, I didn't have much trouble rewording some of this. I, I, I don't think it would be too much work. Yeah. One, one place to look is when you, and this is something we've talked about in a previous workshop, is when you have passive, like can be derived, you can spin that around and make it active, and that can really help you, you know, rephrase it. Uh, and that gets into another issue, which is, would all of this need to be cited anyway? That is, could you reword this and paraphrase it and kind of use it as general knowledge information, common knowledge information, or is it something that would have to be cited no matter what? Yeah, I'm not sure, but I would, I would go on the side of citing it. I, I don't, I'm not sure. And that's what I was, I was hoping to go here and look and see if it was a, a proprietary uh, set of guidelines or if it was something that was fairly general and I, I wasn't successful in finding that but I, I it's specific enough that I would think you know you would probably want to go ahead and go ahead and cite it yeah it should be is right yeah and one of the things I should have done in this 
with quotations is the, the notation for when you have an error like that. If you're directly quoting it, which is what I'm doing here, I'm directly quoting this from the original, is you don't correct the error, but you put the Latin word SIC in brackets after the error. And that's it's a Latin word that means thus or so. It's an editorial mark which says that there's an error here, but it appears in the original. It's not mine. So if you're borrowing something and quoting it, you don't actually fix the error. You put that mark after it to show that the error is not yours. It belongs to somebody else. Some people have, have started saying that this means spelling is correct, which is not what it means. That's what they say. It, it, it's a funny thing they come up with, but it actually is a Latin word that means thus or so. And it just tells the reader that the error that comes right before it is not yours. It actually shows up in the original. Which, as you can imagine, nowadays in the age of the internet, you have to use that a lot because there's so much out there that's not really been proofread or gone through an editorial process. So there are a lot of errors out there. Okay, so what about the, the other part um, with the sentences? Did anybody come up with anything? Because what I was thinking we would do is maybe get a brave... guinea pig to write theirs up here. Let's see if anybody's brave enough to do that. Anybody want to write theirs? Want to write yours? It could be either one of them, or you can do both if you want. One that's a complete sentence, and one that's just a phrase. That's fine. Okay, so was some of this going to be quoted? Oh. Which, is that one of the... Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So, the very first sentence of the original passage, split up. Does it look okay to everybody? Did he paraphrase it appropriately? Looking at the very first sentence under original passage. <laughs> 
on, on the first page, split Hopkinson bar is an inexpensive device for performing high strain rate experiments. And he said high strain rate experiments can be performed by using an inexpensive device called uh, split Hopkinson bar. Well, I, when, I was, when I said that, I was talking about if it's already passive, you can make it active. To paraphrase it, this went the other direction. It was already active, and he was making it passive. Yes, no? Change what? Or conducted, maybe conducted. Oops. Might even be able to do away with buy. All right. How about one of the quotations from the reverse side? Anybody have any luck coming up with one of those? No takers? Well, Two examples of what we talked about earlier today, which is a complete sentence that you quote, so you attach it to your own words, and then a phrase that's just a part of a sentence that you put, uh, splice into your own sentence. So let's do one together. Maybe that's the way to go about it. So maybe something like this. So even though we said when you have a list like that, uh, you can sometimes get away with not quoting it because uh, it's a very specific order of items. Uh, I went ahead and used that as the example. So if you were going to, instead of writing it yourself, quote it, 
This part would be your own words, the split Hopkinson bar, and then quote, consists of four long pressure bars, and you copy all the rest of it exactly, and then we have our citation at the end. Right. So that's the incomplete sentence. It's not a, not a complete sentence. So for a whole one, or a complete sentence rather, All right, so here's the complete sentence example. I'll put a line here to separate them. According to author slash source, the strain rates produced by this device depends on the length of the specimens. That's a mistake, period. Goes outside the citation like that. Now, we need to add something that we just talked about a second ago. Do, do you know what it is? Remember, I made the comment that that original passage itself is not very well written. So, we need to account for an error. It, it is depends, but it's not because of device, it's because of what? Exactly, right. So this is a, an, a, an agreement error. The strain rates, the subject and verb of the sentence are rates depends, and we can't have the S in both places. So they got, they, as often happens, they got thrown off by device depends, which sounds correct, except device isn't the subject of the sentence. So you would need that SIC like we talked about here. to account for that error. The brackets are really useful in quotations. One thing you might do out of context is in, after this device, spell out what this, because this is so relative, somebody might not actually know what that refers to. So you might say, instead of this device in brackets, split uh, Hopkinson I left the H out, I'm not doing very well. Split Hopkinson pressure bar, you might say that instead in brackets, or say this device and then just put it right after that to clarify what it is, because this device by itself, we, you know, they may not be able to tell depending on where it is. Okay? All right. Well, that was about it. Um, the next one is next week. Remember, because we had to reschedule last week, so we're a week apart now. Like next week is our last one, and it's going to be on uh, oral presentations. So that's what uh, that's what we'll talk about next week.
And as we've done in the past, this week, I'll get these materials and also a video of, of today uh, uploaded to this website so you'll have, have uh, external access to it. All right. Thank you for coming, and as always, uh, feel free to take drinking cookies as you, as you wish. Uh, see you later.